first thing to say is that I am not entirely comfortable doing this sort of thing. I'm a bat and ball person. You usually find me um, on a tennis court. I'm also getting to that sort of age where I regularly forget what I'm about to say and what I'm about to do. And uh, my partner on Strictly, the lovely Anton Dubeck, discovered that very soon into our uh, dancing relationship uh, to the extent where one day when we were waiting backstage to go onto uh, the, the walk on you start at the top of the stage and you walk down the stairs so you actually have to line up on a stair going up the way and uh, two of the dancers Caroline and Pasha who went on to win the series were practicing down a side corridor and I went to have a little look at what they were doing I came back and I said to Anton why do you never do that with me and he said waste of time my love you would forget it halfway up the stairs <laughs> which was absolutely right anyway we weren't here to talk about Strictly we we're here to talk about uh, nurturing sporting talent so Oh. <laughs> well, as you can see, this is Jamie and Andy, age two and three. They have Wimbledon t-shirts already and they have tennis rackets, so clearly I was bringing them up to become Wimbledon champions. <laughs> clearly I wasn't. Somebody else gave them the t-shirts. I did actually buy them the, the bats. But um, for me, um, at that age, they don't have talent. Uh, they are waiting for parents to introduce them to trying lots of different uh, things and creating the opportunity for them to try sport or, or, or other activities and then to spend the time with them helping them to either develop a love for what they're doing or the skill uh, to, to take it forward. So for my kids, uh, they were very fortunate that they had parents and grandparents who would play every sport under the sun with them whenever they wanted to because we are a very uh, sporting family. So when they were young, they developed really good uh, hand-eye and foot-eye coordination skills so that it wouldn't have mattered what sport they'd wanted to try as they got older. They'd have been able to do it uh, fairly uh, competently. Uh, their first... Uh, court playing tennis was with a balloon over our sofa in the front room uh, graduated to swing ball in the backyard and then two chairs with a piece of rope in the driveway and sponge balls playing tennis uh, at at home we did however live very close to the tennis courts and therefore when you're talking about nurturing sporting talent the proximity of a suitable facility is actually very important so we were about 500 meters from the local tennis club and uh, at the time that my kids were small, I was a volunteer coach at our local club. I was also working as a, a sales rep. Um, but when Andy was five, he announced to me one day that he was fed up playing with me and his brother and his granny, and he wanted to play in a proper tournament. And when I looked at the local leagues in our area, they were for under 12s, and he was only five and Jamie was six, so obviously that's like years away. So what I did was I created a, a, a tournament. I, I contacted a number of other coaches that I knew, and they brought some of their other children who were under 10, and we had a real fun uh, competition. And from that, those other coaches took the idea back to their clubs, and so a kind of under 10 circuit was born um, in Scotland. Because as you know, Scotland is not a tennis nation. We have terrible weather, hardly any indoor facilities um, still and it's very much a minority sport up here and no track record of, of um, success at all. So when uh, he was seven and uh, six and Jamie was seven, uh, the competition thing is still a bit of a, an issue and also tennis is an individual sport. It's much more fun for kids to play things with their friends and to play in teams. So I discovered that there was a primary school uh, tennis championship, a, a British uh, thing and uh, so I entered a team from Dunblane Primary School the other parents helped me to run the team and I, I kind of did the coaching and they um, set up the fixtures and so forth but it was stimulating a love of playing the game which is quite different from a love of hitting a ball over uh, the net and it was around this time that I updated my or upgraded I guess my coaching qualification that I'd done when I was a student and I'd done it uh, as a means of making some pocket money when I was a student uh, but as the as some the kids that I was working with at the club got better and better I realized that I didn't know enough so I upgraded my qualification which gave me a lot of information but actually no real um, understanding of how to apply that information um, practically and one of the issues in Scotland for me when I got more and more into tennis coaching was that there was nobody to learn from um, very few tennis coaches in Scotland and, and in actual fact there's there um, still are so uh, Moving on just, just a little bit, this is uh, the boys at sort of eight and nine when they had played each other and, are and fought with each other in the final of an, of an under 10 uh, competition. By this uh, time, I was the Scottish national coach. Um, I really didn't have any business being the Scottish national coach. 
as in uh, I wasn't particularly qualified, but the post had been vacant for 18 months and it might sound like quite a grand thing to be the national coach, but we are talking a very, very minority sport. So the post had been vacant for 18 months. Uh, somebody encouraged me to apply for it. I applied for it, they gave me the job and I pretty much had a blank canvas because nothing had been happening for such a long time. And around the same time, the first indoor tennis centre in Scotland opened at Stirling University, which was about five miles from where we live. So I go back to local local facility offering an opportunity. I had a salary of £25,000 and a budget of £90,000 and that was for everything from talent identifying age seven right up to the senior team. You actually can't play for Scotland at tennis, you play for a GB, it's a GB sport, but that was it, £90,000, four courts and a £25,000 salary, no staff. And um, what I did was I, I set up um, what I called a development school at, at Stirling and it was just on weekends because the kids had to come from across the country so they had to travel long distances. Um, and we started with 20 children that I kind of handpicked from around the country. And of those, Andy was probably the youngest one, uh, Elena Baltasha would have been the oldest one. Um, but of those 20 children that we started with, four went on to play Davis Cup and one went on to play Fed Cup uh, for Great Britain. Four of them played Olympics, two of them have won Grand Slams. Uh, one's won Olympic gold and silver, another has won a Commonwealth Games uh, gold medal. So my message when I talk about this is actually, it's not about what you have, it's what you do with what you have. And my initial starting point of staff was actually the, the parents. But I also had to develop a workforce. So I got £10,000 from Sports Scotland for performance coach development. And I started with six coaches. And I brought in coaches from overseas to um, help me, because I didn't know, um, to help me and to help them. And of those six coaches that I started with, one heads up disability tennis in the UK, one runs a scholarship programme at Stirling University, one is one of uh, GB's top coach educators and the other one is uh, GB's Davis Cup captain. So actually out of pretty much nothing, we got a huge um, payback. Not used to using these things. Um, fast forwarding again, um, moving into when uh, Jamie and Andy were kind of around 12, uh, they had the opportunity to go to Miami to play in the Orange Bowl, which is a kind of unofficial world 12 and under uh, championships. And Jamie went one year, Andy went the following year. Jamie made the final, Andy won it. And what for me had been like a huge adventure suddenly became quite serious because suddenly my kids were among the best in the world for their age and I realized that I didn't know anything. So again, I had to travel. Um, I kind of picked everybody brain, I videoed people, I had notebooks and notebooks full of uh, notes from speaking to people because I had to learn about, I know my kids are among the best in the world under 12, How, what, do we, what do we do next, what's the next two years look like and actually for me the learning has always been about what comes next, finding somebody who's done that next stage, pick their brains and then try to apply it as best as we, we could um, over here. Also think it's worth mentioning at this stage that I have I have two children um, and although they both have careers as professional tennis players, they are both very different from each other and the whole thing I think about nurturing talent is to the better you can get to know what's in front of you as people, the more influence you can have over them because you then know what they re react to, what they respond to. I have two very different children in terms of character. One is left-handed, one's right-handed. Physically, they are very different and personality, they're actually also very different. So Andy, of course, right-handed, uh, plays singles, a very um, aggressive baseliner. Wasn't always an aggressive baseliner, was probably more a, a passive baseliner with um, exceptional hand skills, which were developed at a young age. And Jamie's skills were all around the net and on serve. So he went on to become a very successful doubles player, Andy went on to become a very successful singles player, but they went through, although they came up in the same way, they went through very different routes um, to get there. Uh, Jamie um, obviously finished school, could have gone to an American university, wanted to play tennis. It was very clear to me when he was about 19 that he wasn't going to make it as a singles player, had to find an expert doubles coach to help him, could only afford six weeks with this guy, but seven weeks after he started with Jamie, he made his first ATP uh, tour final. It's Andy winning the US Open Juniors, uh, that was when our life changed, suddenly had to learn to deal with being in the spotlight, deal with the media, but also to learn the life and business of being a full-time athlete rather than just a coach of junior players where it's actually all great fun uh, and a big comfort zone. 
Jamie won the Wimbledon title first um, a year after he started with this coach that I could only afford for, for six weeks. So he kind of led the way uh, in that. And then, of course, six years after that, Andy managed to win uh, his first Wimbledon title. But all those years in between, there's lots and lots of learnings. There's lots of changes of coach. There's, uh, so for me, it's all about trying to do the right thing at the right time and finding the right people to put around them at the right time. because. And, and being in the background trying to manage uh, everything that, that you have to learn. But everything's new um, for us. And for me, it was very much learning uh, as, I, as I went along. This is us, all of us. We still try to encourage um, uh, children to become physically active and, and play sport. Uh, obviously, our sport's tennis, but I think the importance of, of keeping kids phys physically ac active is uh, very uh, much a part of what they can, the boys can do as, as role models in the sport. So my message really is that talent uh, without opportunity doesn't come to anything. You need talent, you need opportunity, then you need the right environment, and you need to be able to work hard. You never really know where you're going to get. But um, it is often the case that you get opportunity without talent. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't really come to very much. So then you, then you have to flip it on its head. And, you, and you, you do what you do best, and you teach your partner how to play tennis. And I'm happy to say that he was just as bad at tennis as I was at uh, dancing. <laughs> the end. Thank you. <laughs>